So having the opportunity to introduce Mike over the last 19 uh, years of this annual retreat, and uh, probably over a, a thousand times over the last uh, two decades, I'm glad you brought up the two-decade uh, uh, mark, Pat, uh, because uh, we're uh, uh, it, finishing uh, two decades uh, in the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And when I look back at this meeting, I'm going to say the same thing that I've said for the last two decades every single year. Uh, in that I believe this to be the best annual meeting of prostate cancer anywhere in the world. And I also believe that each year is the best year that we've ever had. Uh, I believed it in 1993, and I believe it in 2012. So uh, the reason ma many people wonder, why do we do such a good job, and why has this foundation been so successful? I, I would say that the secret sauce was revealed yesterday in the memorable and moving tribute to Dr. Trip Cassells, who, as you uh, know, uh, succumbed to uh, metastatic prostate cancer just this month. Uh, the beautiful speeches by Mike and Jonathan and Howard and ultimately Dan Zenka uh, really are the secret sauce of this organization. It's one that has a very big brain, but it also has a very big heart that pumps blood to that brain. And I believe it's the soul and the, the derivation that combines both compassion for people who have this disease with an unquenchable uh, desire and drive uh, to eradicate it. So uh, that's the Prostate Cancer Foundation's uh, DNA, and uh, uh, we're very proud of that, and I've been proud to be a part of it since its inception. Now, in introducing Mike, I've done it so many times that I always try to challenge myself to come up with a few novel ways uh, to do it and say a few things that you might not have heard before, and I was really, it's getting more and more difficult each year. But yesterday, uh, so I'll try to connect a few disparate thoughts. Uh, yesterday, uh, when Howard initiated the meeting, he showed a little video called The Spirit of PCF. And there was one little clip in it that kind of tweaked my imagination, uh, which was Mike bagging groceries uh, at Safeway uh, and uh, asking the, uh, the person who bought the groceries whether he could assist them and carry the bags to the car. It always gets a laugh when it plays, and that's because of the obviously incongruous nature uh, of, the, of the clip. But in thinking about it a little more uh, after I saw it, it's really true that uh, Mike has been carrying the bags of the people in this group uh, for 20 years. Uh, he has provided a tremendous support in, in innumerable ways, and it's uh, created a very group of uh, well-recognized prostate cancer researchers and specialized specialists, uh, many of whom and most of whom are in this room. But that recognition has been very well deserved. And we're proud of the people whose uh, work we've supported in this institution because the careers of the people that are in this room are, are bear testimony to the fact that we supported uh, good people and our human capital worked very well. Uh, the second piece of uh, information that uh, comes from Mike's annual lectures, which he's got a little book that catalog catalog catalogs all the ones that he's given over the years. And over the years, he's made the point to us that 50% of the economic growth of this country over the last century has been uh, generated by the improved health and life expectancy of its population. And I think that when I first heard it, it was a very profound statement, and uh, I've given it a lot of thought. So to kind of turn it around a little bit, uh, Mike was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 1993, and in about two or three months, he'll, he'll celebrate his 20 years of disease-free survival. And when I think about the economic impact that his health and, and survival has had on our field and on medicine in general, uh, I would defy any of the people who are uh, good calculators in this audience to try to put an economic number on the value of his 20 years of life expectancy for this field. Uh, thirdly, uh, you're going to hear a lot in his talk today about the celebration of science, which was an unbelievable event, which he will do better than I to describe, but I had the privilege of being there. And I don't want to focus on it other than to, because he will, but to uh, direct your attention to this op-ed piece, which was all in all of your packets, which occurred in the Wall Street Journal on the day we convened in Washington for this event. And there's a lot of really good information. It makes a great argument for uh, the fact that uh, investing in research is an investment, not a line item uh, in a budget. 
and all the reasons why that's true. But I just want to focus on one paragraph, and I want to read it to you. Friday morning in Washington, a town not known these days for widespread consensus, a remarkable gathering of leaders begins a weekend of events devoted to a single proposition, science matters. The senior leadership of the US Senate House from both parties is joining more than 1,000 scientists, medical researchers, university presidents, Nobel laureates, corporate CEOs, cabinet secretaries, philanthropists, presidential advisors, and patient advocates. A celebration of science will do more than honor the past. Participants will be developing specific nonpartisan proposals designed to help strengthen the future of American science. I would submit to you that there are very few people in the world that can make that kind of an event happen. All the people that I outline in all the categories are very important in their own right. Their time is very valuable, and it's hard to get them to give up a weekend to support an event like this. But since we're in the middle of a political season and we've heard a lot about the so-called ground game uh, in politics, I would argue that Mike Milken's ground game, which is largely the force of his personality, his incredible doggedness, uh, his ability to effectively use the telephone, uh, and uh, his incredible persistence at working on this for only three months enable those people to come in the room, and I can't think of many other people who could have accomplished that. So that's a tribute, uh, uh, stands alone as, as an accomplishment which is uh, incomparable as far as I'm concerned. And lastly, on a personal note, I'd like to wish that all the physicians and physician scientists and, and people in the audience uh, would uh, have the, uh, a rich experience like I've had over the last 20 years to develop a relationship with a patient uh, who has benefited from treatment, done extremely well, and over the course of working together and, uh, and spending a lot of time together, uh, has become a, a true friend, a friend not only of myself, but my family. We've shared weddings together. We've shared the birth of grandchildren together. And it's been a real privilege to be associated with him over the last 20 years. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, our friend, uh, our CEO and founder, uh, Mike Milken, to address you today. Thank you. Well, first, uh, thank you very much, Skip. Pat Walsh, it's great to see you and Don Coffey with us. And uh, as you know, I'm the happiest person to be here with you today because uh, 20 years ago, it didn't look like I'd be joining you at the 20th uh, scientific retreat. Before I go any farther, I would like to see if uh, Jonathan Simons and Howard Sewell could stand up. Um, you've just heard from Skip Holden, but the four of us have been together a long time. Jonathan was teamed up with Bill Nelson and the Hopkins team, and I noticed we have 25 people from Hopkins that have made it here. And Jonathan Howard, just want to thank you, and I've enjoyed our time together and look forward to many years in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have a lot to cover in the next uh, hour. And as you can expect tonight, we've been hard at work on your quizzes. I know every year many of you look forward to these quizzes that teach you some of the most important things that have occurred in history and, and get you to focus on the future. But part of the future is the Movember campaign, those growing of mustaches in the month of November all around the world. We'll talk about it. And I just want to review the quiz questions from last year that many of you missed. Uh, they will not be there tonight, of course, because we only make up new questions. And I was so disappointed that no one made it to the World Beard and Mustache Championships in Strodheim, Norway this year. Maybe next year you'll put it on your bucket list. There, was, there were some fantastic mustaches uh, during that period of time that many of you missed. And so here's the first question, uh, which King in a standard deck of cards does not have a mustache. King of spades, king of diamonds, king of hearts, and king of clubs. So how many think it's A? No one. 
B, no. Oh, some Bs, good. Okay, good. I noticed a number of women were voting for the diamonds. I don't know if it had anything to do with whether the king had a mustache or not. Okay. C, most of you were here last year, and D. Okay, great. All right, and something that I know that you've kept ever since last year, according to the Guinness Book of Records, how long was the longest mustache in history? Pretty hard to grow it in one month during, was it 49.8? Anyone want to vote for that? 79 inches? 100 inches? Okay, we've got some votes on this side of the room. An almost vote over there. 133 inches? 225 inches. Answer D. D. You know, I don't know how well you did in standardized tests, but generally, <laughs> if you don't have a clue, D is a very good guess. Okay, <laughs> from that standpoint. So before I really go much farther, I wanted to introduce you to an individual that played a significant part of the celebration of science. He serves in the U.S. House from this district. Many of the biotech companies that are here are in his district. As is University of California at San Diego, Scripps, Salk, Sanford, Burnham, Howard Hughes Medical Foundation at UCSD. And he has been a leader in fighting for research for the bioscience in the Congress. He's also been a leader focused on immigration reform and fully has recognized in speeches and talks the importance of, being, of letting the best and brightest, most qualified people come to the United States. Congressman Bilbray is co-chair of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus and like everyone in America, with one in two men and one in three women, cancer has struck his family. And his daughter, Brianna, has been battling melanoma. And has been, he's been extremely instrumental in helping to strengthen the Melanoma Research Alliance, um, whose leader is here with us, Wendy Selig. And I'd like to introduce uh, Congressman Byron Bilbray to speak to us for a few minutes. Congressman. Mr. Milgram, it's an honor uh, to be here, to be asked to be here. Uh, first of all, let me just say as a, uh, a local kid that was born here at North Island Naval Air Station, I want to uh, welcome all of you to our little corner of the world. I want to apologize for the weather. <clears throat> well, I know how tough it is staying indoors. Well, the rest of us, now you know why so many of us didn't go to school in our younger days. Uh, yes, I was uh, actually, um, I like this uh, Movember issue. My mother was an Australian war bride. In fact, the first Australian war bride to get her citizenship. My father was a naval officer. In fact, the story is told, my parents met in the lobby of General MacArthur's office during World War II. Uh, so if any of you from the Philippines, if he hadn't left the Philippines, I wouldn't be here. So thank God for that PT boat getting him out. Look, let me just say sincerely, I have the honor of serving on the Energy Commerce Committee, uh, actually doing a lot of oversight. <clears throat> but representing San Diego in so many ways gives an added responsibility to serving in the House of Representatives. And that is because um, I have to recognize things politically that you take for granted every day. I don't need to tell you about what I call the trinity of hope, uh, the venture, uh, the, the basic science that NIH puts out there. Um, and let me just say something about that be, uh, basic science. The uh, Constitution gives us a lot of responsibilities, not a whole lot, but defines it. There's a lot of things we do in the federal government that has nothing to do with our constitutional obligation. But when you hear people talk about what we're spending our money on, let me just be really blunt with you, the science and perpetuation of the science specifically addressed in Article I, right from the get-go. 
the Founding Fathers realized that if the federal government needed to take a lead in patent protection and science, the perpetuation of the science. And so when we talk about maintaining funding for the NIH, this is not just a feel-good kind of thing that we want to do. This is an obligation under the Constitution that we have to do. And I want to address that. The second item that is the, the um, what I call the, the trinity of hope is that venture capital. The people that actually take that basic science and bridge the gap um, between the, the basic science people and those who are going to deliver the product to the consumer. And that gap, sadly, has to go over what we call the valley of death. And that valley of death so often is not just an economic one, it is a regulatory government bureaucratic one. And that is an issue we need to address, too. And then we have what I call the big guys, the, the, the pharmaceuticals, the companies actually deliver it. And I kind of picture it, being a surfer, I kind of uh, think of it like, you guys doing the basic uh, study is the, the plankton. And we've got to nurture you. We've got to make sure there's enough nutrients to be able to keep you alive so you can grow and prosper. And then the uh, middleman comes through, the venture capitalists, and they're the krill. And the krill will not exist if you're not there and healthy. And then the big guy, everybody remembers the insurance company, the big whale jumping out. That, uh, then the big guy is the whale that shows up and eats the krill and is healthy and delivers it to the consumer. And this trinity of hope has to be a sustainable biosphere from, from the scientific and economic point of view. And that's our challenge. Let me just say this to you. What is a... Uh, a politician who t had to take his, his, uh, his um, biology test three times to get out of high school doing standing in front of your group. It is because, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is what makes America great. I don't understand anything you're doing, but I'm on the committee of jurisdiction that has to make sure that those of us in Washington help, do, help you do whatever you do while you're doing it. You guys are going to leave here scared to death for the future of the country. <laughs> but let me say sincerely, one of the things I'm trying to get Democrats and Republicans working on, and this is the one thing. You hear all this talk about why isn't anybody working together? How many of you know that we just did a major FDA reform and Obama signed it in, the president signed in the law? Everybody read it, it was on the front page, all the talking heads on MSNBC and Fox were, they weren't. Um, the problem is there, you don't sell papers talking about our, when we're working together. We are moving together and we are going to be looking specifically at making sure Washington becomes an ally of what you're doing. That we don't pull the rug out from under you when it comes to basic research. But we also close the valley of death and start having the federal bureaucracy working with those who are trying to transfer basic science to the consumer and save lives. We want to make sure that our tax law encourages American money to come back and go and be invested in in uh, R&D and research here, rather than forcing it to stay overseas and cited overseas. All of these things are very important. But if there's one thing I would ask you to do that we learned from the 90s, and we learned from the AIDS crisis. I was there in the 90s when we addressed the AIDS crisis. The problem is we do not have the, the feeling of urgency being forced on the process, and we need that urgency. Those who are waiting patiently every day for a breakthrough to save their lives have the right to demand that the system needs to respond to the crisis of cancer in the same manner that we did for AIDS. Now, granted, there are scientific differences. But from the political point of view, there is no difference and there should be no difference. Their degree of urgency should be there. Why does an AIDS patient be allowed on a clinical review board but not a cancer patient? There's no justification for it except politics. And that's where we come in. That is why you're going to see people like NASU, Ed Markey. I can go down the list, Democrats and Republicans, working together to say, we did it in the 90s. We created a, a breakthrough in the 90s for one disease. Why aren't we doing this for the others? And that's our challenge, not to accept anything less than the urgency that we would, we would force on the system if it was our child, if it was our daughter with stage three melanoma. If it was our friend who's dying today in, in El Cajon from prostate cancer, that the system needs to respond to reality as politicians and as representatives as much as if it was one of our family. Because it is. 
This is not a Democrat or Republican. This is not just an American issue. This is a human issue. And you guys are the Merlins that will create miracles, not just in the distant future, but in the near future. If we just make it legal for you to do it, if we just make sure you get what it takes to create your miracles. And that's where we're going to need to work together. So I just like to say to you, please put the pressure on us. Expect more, demand more, because it really matters much more than politics. It matters about lives. And I just like to say that I think that all of us can look forward to the future, that we look back and say, doggone it, we did extraordinary things in the 90s. Now's the time to do those extraordinary things in the future. So I'll just say, again, thank you very much for all you guys do. Thank you for um, all the miracles that we have taken for granted for too much. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get Washington, the FDA, investment capital, and everybody else working with you to get the job done. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be here with Mr. Melkin. And um, get out there, create lots of miracles, make lots of money so we can tax you to support our bad habits in Washington. God bless you. Thank you, Congressman. And he was too modest. He fully understands a great deal of what you've done. And it is no coincidence that this area of the country has grown so much in the biotech area when you have a person in Congress that's so focused on supporting it. Well, there's a lot of things to talk about today. And we'd like to start with things that will change the world. And so the first thing I wanted to touch on was the changing demographics and the rising middle class around the world. I think as we've discussed over the years, there's a tremendous change in the United States. It's an unusual country, maybe the first country in the history of the world who has changed its face peacefully. And if you look at the different growth rates over the past decade, you can see the dramatic change. And as anyone who fully understands, biology understands, is not where you are, it's the growth rates. And this dramatic change in growth rates is changing the country. We're here in California, and almost everything that happens in the United States starts in California. And you can see here today that the majority of citizens in the state of California are either of Latin American ancestry and Asian ancestry have now the majority. And it won't be long before the majority of citizens in the state of California are of just Latin American ancestry. But the growing, the growth today in the Asian and Latin American population is so significant that it bodes that at some point in this century, in the first half of this century, the majority of people in the United States will be of either Latin American or Asian ancestry. And as I've mentioned to a number of you over the years, we will rewrite the textbooks. The United States will be looking south to Latin America and will be looking, uh, depending on which side you're on, either east or west, uh, to Asia. But the relationship with Europe is going to change dramatically as this population changes. Now, I looked over the list of people, the 435 of you are here, and I did not see one commercial residential real estate broker. But if you were, I think it's a key to know who your client is. So here's the clients in the state of California in 1990. Smith, Lee, Johnson, Brown, Williams, Miller, Jones. So therefore, Interacting with people of European ancestry would be a key to your success. And these are the surnames ranked in decreasing order. The number one surname of a person who bought a home in 1990 in the state of California was Smith. Last was Jones, third was Johnson. So if we step to 2010, you had to change your business strategy. The number one surname of a person who bought a home in the state of California in 2010 was of Vietnamese ancestry. Then Lee, primarily Korean, Garcia, Chan, Lopez, Rodriguez, Gonzalez, Hernandez, Martinez, and Kim. There is not one European surname in the top 10 in the state of California 20 years later. So 
Get to know your customer if you decide you want to moonlight as a commercial real estate broker in the state. The change in individuals in this country that weren't born here has been just as dramatic in the last 50 years. 50 years ago, 85% of every single person not born in the United States who was here came from either Canada or Europe. 50 years later, 80, more than 80% of them come from either Latin America or Asian, and it's pretty easy to understand the focus of this political, national political campaign, particularly on the Latin American who's here in the United States. Maybe more telling is this movement around the world, and this is a, a chart that was published from Credit Suisse recently on wealth in the world, and it might be a surprise to many of you, but if you look at Australia, for example, the country in the world that has the largest median wealth is Switzerland. But a country with a population of 20 million or more, Australia is number one, with average wealth of $355,000. Italy, 213, Japan, 269. Uh, China growing, but still at 20, with a much obviously larger population, and the United States at 262. But I'd focus your attention here on the median, the level where half the people in the country have wealth above that line or below. And in, in the United States today, as you think about communicating with the citizens in a democracy, half the adults in the United States have less than $40,000 in wealth. This is not income, this is wealth. So what they're thinking about, what they're focused on, whether it's this election or, or future elections, Half the, and if you go to Italy, which we read about all their issues, it's at 124,000. So Italy is more than three times the United States at a median level. The rise of the middle class is maybe the most profound story changing the world. It is centered in Latin America, particularly South America, but its real center is in Asia. Now, middle class means that you can meet your needs, you can pay for your home, your housing, your food, necessities, and have money left over. So it's not related to amount, because it's related to the purchasing power and other things in that society. But you can see this enormous explosion of wealth that's occurring in the middle class and the growth in the middle class in China, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, the fourth largest country in terms of population, and substantial increase in, in India. And this changed in the middle class where the majority of people in the world in the middle class will be in Asia. The country that will have the world's largest population, India, taking a look at its impoverished and the dramatic change that's occurring in India will have a profound effect on the world just as it deals with issues of producing products that the middle class can buy at their price point and forcing innovation in India. And to me, in many ways, this is one of the world's great success stories. And besides all the negativism that you read in the newspaper, challenges that the United States and Europe have particularly, this is one of the real areas of growth and excitement for the world. The change has already occurred if you would look at where U.S. companies have moved their employment. And so over the last decade, you've had more than a 200% increase in employees of U.S. companies in China, a 600% increase in people in India working for U.S. companies, you know, a substantial increase in Brazil and Mexico, and you can see little to no change in the traditional European parts of the world. But this movement has already begun. And the world's economic clout, if you look at a city, not based on population, but you look at the economic development of a city, you can look at rankings to tell you what is the economy of that city, what is going on in that city. You will see, in many ways, that there's been a shift, a tremendous shift towards Asia 20 of the world's top 50 cities will be located in Asia in the next 12 to 13 years. Half of Europe's top 50 cities are going to drop off the list, as will some here in North America. Shanghai and Beijing 
passing Los Angeles and London in terms of their economic activity, and Mumbai and Doha surpassing Munich and Denver. So this process has begun. The movement's there. If you think of medical tourism and what's going on, and, or just tourism itself, there's been a dramatic changes. These were the top destinations in 1995 of tourists. If you look at them today, the top two are the same, but China, Turkey, Malaysia have all become, and if you look at the growth, once again, understanding change is more important than an absolute basis. You can see the dramatic change in tourism, and I would suggest to you, as the United States becomes increasingly an Asian Latin American country, that we're gonna see far more tourism moving to Asia than it's in Europe, and this is just a look at if you're in this business in China, the enormous growth that's occurring as the middle class rises in China. Things that will change the world. First, my little formula helped change the world in finance and financial technology made a big difference in this concept of prosperity, this formula I scribbled down at Berkeley in 1965 was really one on how do you create jobs, how do you create prosperity, and you needed access to financial assets to leverage your ideas. The sheer thought today that after 20 years that many of you are now spending increasing amounts of your time working on applications to, for grants and raising money obviously is diverting time that you could be spending on trying to find solutions to problems. We started there 20 years ago. But it's no different for you than others. The idea of a cellular, mobile telephone, cable television, other types of ideas required access to capital, which leveraged the world's leading source of assets, your ability and others, human capital, social capital, the second largest form. And why do 60% of every, why does everyone over $1.6 million in net worth in China, 60% of them want to leave China. And why do they want to come primarily to the United States, two thirds, and Europe? It's because of social capital. And whether it's property rights, or whether it's cultural resources, or religious freedom, or universal health care access, there are a lot of reasons. And that's why my guess is there's more than a billion people who still believe in the American dream outside of America and want to come here. Financial technology, this leveraging effect, issued many different types of securities. And just like the work of many scientists, it was attacked. But by providing capital to people with ability, no different than our young investigators and supporting them, we changed the face of employment in America over a 30-year period of time between 1970 and 2000, as 62 million jobs were created by small and medium business and large companies created minus four. You can see here as this market opened up that large companies had a harder and harder time competing. And so beginning in 74 and then fully opened up in the 82-3 period, that large companies could just not compete once people with better ideas had access to capital. Can I point at another example of this application? Yes. In the 1980s, a series of movies and 90s came out about acid rain. It's going to shorten our life expectancy, serious problems in America, and financial technology and the Milken Institute got involved with creating markets for SO2. Estimated cost, about $3 billion to create these markets. Estimated benefits, $122 billion. And as you look at what the United States looked like in 1989, 1991, and what it looked like 15 years later, a dramatic change just from creating financial markets that incentivize people to reduce SO2. You read a lot about financial institutions today, but the banks are not playing a major role in America. The revolution of the 1970s, banks today only make up 17% of all bank loans. And the strength of the United States is that organizations are not dependent on a bank for access to capital and their strength. Unfortunately for Europe, this revolution never occurred. 
and most of this capital in Europe still comes from banks, and if the banks are weak or going to shrink, you're going to be denied capital. In the last couple of weeks, it was pointed out by the IMF that they felt the European banks had to shrink by as much as $4.5 trillion. What does this mean to the world? This means that Europe will actually not be providing capital to the world, but will be shrinking. It can be easily seen that the European banks are too large compared to their countries. Ireland, a country with tremendous governmental policies, was brought down not by the governmental policies, but by four banks who went with irresponsible lending and then the government absorbing the liabilities of those banks. The three largest French banks today are as large as the three largest U.S. banks, even though our, the U.S. economy is five times as large as France. France cannot afford the potential losses of their banking system. If you look at China and its growth going, you'll see a lot of discussion about the big Chinese banks. 88% of all the employees in China work for small businesses. Almost all the loans from the banks are to big companies. China will not be able to create jobs going forward unless it revises its financial system to find a way, as the United States did. Financial technology is essential, whether it's crowdsourcing that I'll talk about in a few minutes to get capital to you without you investing as much time in your requesting grants, or whether it's new financial instruments that allow people with new ideas to have access to capital. Education, and almost every discussion over the past 20 years, I've touched on education. It was the secret of the United States of America. By 1960, the United States was by far the most educated country in the world, adding one year of formal schooling for every decade, and exceeding by 1960, by two years, the education levels of any other country in the world. Primarily, the United States was educated by women who were the best and brightest in their, in their class or their group, who in many cases were denied equal opportunities except for nursing or teaching. That changed in the 1970s, and with that, the United States has not made any progress in the last 50 years. Other countries have passed the United States during this period of time. Skilled and unskilled jobs, which you have in, in your laboratories, have dramatically changed what it means to have a job today in America. The middle class, the middle class life of two cars and kids going to college was achievable 60 years ago without a skill. And today at the Milken Institute, we estimate at this time, there will be almost 70 million job openings that would be available over the next eight years in the United States if we had an educated population to take those jobs. And that's one of the reasons why you see this tremendous growth in jobs by U.S. companies overseas in search of talent. The most important element in education, early child care education. The rate of return on educating children before the age of six, a dollar invested in a five-year-old, Nobel Prize winner James Heckman told us, it would take three dollars by the time you're 15 and five dollars by the time you're 22 and 10 dollars by the time you're 30 to have the same output. The United States is really not focused, unfortunately, on this area, and Pell Grants are for college, not for early child care. It's an area where I uh, personally have put most of my capital in education, trying to see what we could do at our knowledge universe companies and in increasing the quality. The average child today in our Singapore early child care centers by the age of six is two years ahead academically of the average child in the United States by the age of six. Over 20 years, we've looked at this startling statistic, and that is that Unfortunately, the middle class in America, utility curve has been diverted by the U.S. government trying to convince you that your house is the most important thing. How big your house is, how far it is away from you, where you work, and your car is your second most important thing. 
And today in America, the middle class still spends more than 50% of their income on their house and their car versus what is now 16% in 11 Asian countries. In the United States, we still spend more than 25 times as much on a house and a car as we do on the tutoring or supplemental education of a child. In 11 Asian countries, they spend the same amount. Number one expenditure in Asia is food. Number two, the tutoring or supplemental education of the child. And so educational systems will determine the future of the world. Immigration, highly skilled, entrepreneurial, educated immigrants are crucial to any nation's prosperity. It's an area that Congressman Bill Bray knows well. And we were over in London visiting all the leading universities, as Howard and, and Jonathan and myself and others traveled Europe just seeing the amazing things that are going on. And those amazing things continue to be driven by students who might have come to the US, but because of difficulties in immigration. As we visited Imperial College and looked at their new flexible, minimally evasive surgery, they can wind around rather than being fixed in their biological engineering programs or their new surgery with constant pathology done during surgery so you don't have to wait for any biopsies. You found that many of the people working on this would have been in the US, uh, but they could not get visas to come in the US. Startling when you think in a decade the number of students from China and Malaysia has gone from 108 to 1,800 in just one university in the UK. And as Jonathan and Howard have pointed out, just the potential, whether it's in Beijing or Shanghai or other parts of China today, is exciting when we think about it. And we should not forget today in our own strength that more than half of all the scientists in Silicon Valley and engineers were not born in the United States, that more than 15% of all the startup companies were founded by people that came from India, and another 13% from China and Taiwan, and how dependent we are and how strong we are when we have right immigration laws that lets people that want to come to the United States come. Lastly, and for me, maybe the most emotional is energy. There's been a dramatic change in energy. You read about it in the front page in the newspaper. Shale and other technologies that are now being deployed allow us to go after energy we never could before. And so in 1901, we were able to drill to 1,139 feet down in Beaumont, Texas. Today, we're going 9,000 feet in the Marcellus Shale, but able to do horizontal drilling, and it has changed the face of energy in the world. If you look at where the shale oil deposits are in the world and assume those are the new centers for energy in the world, you'll see that most of them don't overlap where there's major traditional oil deposits. So China, Western China, throughout all of the United States and, and Western and Canada, Brazil particularly, South Africa and so on, Northern Europe, substantial shale deposits. When we think about what has occurred over this period of time, the United States, over a 30-year period of time, invested $7.3 trillion in the Gulf on aircraft carriers, dealing with terrorism, war in Iraq and Afghanistan, other types of issues, and the enormous loss of the best and brightest from not just the United States or the UK, but countries around the world, and what would have happened had we accelerated this investment 20 years ago. If you look at the six areas that are cited in energy today, expanded natural gas, hydroelectric power, thermal, shale, biomass, tidal wave, et cetera, when I look at what we're focused on today, it brings me back to a magazine I had looked at almost 40 years ago. It was the 1938 issue of Fortune Magazine. These are the pictures in the 1938 issue from Fortune Magazine on energy. 
on natural gas, hydroelectric power, volcanic, they called it then, oil shale, biomass and ethanol, oceans and tidal power. Just imagine what the world would have been like today had we decided to invest more in these technologies addressing these areas. Today, the United States is now number one in the world in energy reserves based on technology being deployed today. And the potential for growth in jobs, for chemical and other manufacturing companies, the United States has become one of the lowest cost producers of energy in the world. And so this is going to change the world but not just the United States, all those locations. And as we focus a little more of our technology on bioscience, we will also focus that on energy. Next, crowdsourcing. For most of your life and mine, we've been very focused on push. We give you a grant and hope you do some work. Someone hires someone and hope it works out. You have an idea and someone gives you capital. We're entering a period because of technology that's going to be significantly shifting to pull. Prizes, incentive, incentive compensation, incentive awards by governments, industry, companies, and philanthropy. Using the World Wide Web and technology will challenge individuals to come together throughout the world and form teams to try to solve a problem in most cases with a financial prize. One of our board members at Faster Cures and one of our major donors to the Prostate Cancer Foundation and working with Dick Merkin and his company, he put up a prize for $3 million. That prize, can you tell me who's gonna be in the hospital in the next year? Gave you data on 150,000 people that they insure and they take care of and they wanted, you knew their whole history, the medicines they were taking, etc., and where they lived, but had no idea of who the people were. These teams, 44% of the people that entered do not live in the United States. 50% of the people that competed don't work in the healthcare industry. And almost every team was assembled, as some of the prostate cancer teams were, almost every team was assembled by an international group coming together, and many of the teammates didn't know each other until they had signed up. Algorithms were created. Teams won, we did an excellent job, and now those, that knowledge has been deployed by the company Heritage. An easier one for the world to understand than that issue is oil spills. The largest companies in the world Major oil companies worth, in the case of Exxon, over 400 billion. A company like Exxon is probably spending 70 billion dollars a year on capital expenditures. BP oil spill. The United States government, all of its science, Department of Energy, everyone diverted. Can we clean up this oil spill? Oil flowed unabated, 53,000 gallons a day. 180,000 square area. Took five months to cap the wells. BP has already paid $23 billion out to deal with this issue. The question is, could we have done it better? The world scientists involved with this were marshaled by governments and industry. Well, the prize was created. Does anyone on the planet have a better idea? Could they have done it better? The prize was awarded to any team that could devise a strategy 100% more effective than the US or any other government or any energy company. Six teams were able to do that. One team six times as effective, one sixth of the time. One of the teams was headed that was more than double by Fred. Who is Fred? Fred runs a tattoo parlor in Las Vegas. Fred doesn't know anything about oil spills, etc. What he does know is that many people coming to his power want to have their tattoos taken off. How does he get a tattoo off their skin? 
working with a group. He is now an oil spill expert who's had better ideas than anyone that worked for any major oil company in the world or anyone working for the United States government on this project. His team was two and a half times better. He just thought he could help as he saw it on the news and signed up. As you think about your problems, more and more you will find these teams assembled and you too might be a member of some team that intrigues you. As we all know, there is no organization, not even the Prostate Cancer Foundation, that has all the smartest people in the world working for them. They might be working for Google, they might be working for some other company during the day, but at night, they could be working on your problem if you'd let them. The promise of bioscience, the source of the world's prosperity. As Dr. Holden pointed out to you, each life is priceless. In economic terms, however, over the past two centuries, not just in the United States, but in the world, 50% of all economic growth can be traced to advances in health. For 20 years, I've been pointing out to you this miracle that occurred on the planet, where life expectancy on planet Earth doubled in a century. And half of every single person that ever lived to 65 is alive today. If you think about this enormous growth of China and East Asia, it's not hard to understand. Average life expectancy 50 years ago was 46 years of age. In some countries, it was 39. If someone would have told you that average life expectancy was going to increase by 65% in 50 years, you'd say, boy, that's a place I want to be. Enormous investment, growth of population, industry. Just ask yourself, if you thought you were only going to live 45 years, what decisions would you make versus living 75 years of age? The ability to pass things down to not just one generation, but two. For 20 years, we've focused on the fact that lifestyle makes a difference, and that 70% of all the health care costs in the United States is due to lifestyle. 1994 brought an unusual get-together, Dr. David Heber and Dr. Bill Fair. It was the first time Dr. Fair told me he really ever interacted with someone who thought there was some relationship, serious relationship between nutrition and your health. Even our own scientific advisory board at the PCF would not let me schedule David Heber to give a talk during the regular session. Okay, we eventually compromised and let David speak during lunch so that if you were not interested, you couldn't listen to this quack science of nutrition at that point in time. But those of you who knew Bill Fair after that get together in Santa Barbara, his views of the world changed dramatically. And Don Coffey's views of the world and Bill Nelson and others. If you look at the outlook for biomedical research, which is why the celebration of science went on, you'll see the growth rates, China, India, Brazil, and so on. They are focused on this today as the future of their country. And so you see enormous increase in their research spending versus decreases projected for the United States. And this is why a celebration of science occurred. And what's behind these decreases? They can be easily traced to the change in America over the past 20 years. An issue of obesity, which was not an issue in America 20 years ago, with only four states having levels over 15%, to an issue today that every state has over 15%, a high percentage I have over 30 percent, another high percentage 25 to 30. We have a couple visitors from Italy this year. So in their honor, I want to show you why they limit their art that comes to the United States because they're concerned of what it will look like when it comes back. <laughs> We're here in Southern California and this is Orange County. Smart real estate brokers know a market when they see it, and people 
can lease space right next to each other today. <laughs> Business is booming, is booming in California. And those that make MRI machines around our country have had a change. In 1997, the most that a person could weigh in an MRI was 300 pounds. But due to the gaining in weight in America by 2002, it was revised to 440 pounds. And the specs in 2011, you had to hold a person at 660 pounds. Now, you probably, if you fly, have noticed that many of the people that fly have gained weight. The Federal Aviation Administration has also noticed this. And they've therefore assumed an increase in weight on their flights. But so have the beaches here in San Diego. Beach chairs are bigger and now they are tested to 500 pounds to be approved. Now whether that's for one person, two, three, or four, I don't know <laughs> from that standpoint. But my favorite slide comes from the Orange County Fair. And there's some new things this year that you're going to be getting to eat next year. One of my favorite is the new Baby Ruth candy bar, stuffed with deep fried jalapenos and served on a bed of fresh curls. If that isn't what you had in mind, you know, the, the next one that really caught my attention was the quarter of a pound of butter. They saw there was decreasing demand for people to go into the refrigerator and just eat a quarter of a pound of butter. <laughs> so now you have the deep fried quarter of a pound of butter. They've noticed that some people can't eat more than 20 pieces of bacon a day. So they're coming out with the chocolate covered bacon product. Chocolate covered corn dogs. And my all time favorite that I can't wait to taste next year is the solution for what, I'm sure this is a subject in every household in America, what do you do with the bacon fat? What do you do with it? Do you eat it or do you freeze it? And, and most people just don't drink bacon fat. So there's excess bacon fat and therefore, they found a solution for that. The garlic buttered bacon fries are fried in bacon fat. So you can send them your bacon fat and get your French fries now cooked in the bacon fat. This is why we are so focused on, at Faster Cures, forming our new center to focus on prevention and wellness because we have not succeeded in this area. Obesity levels in the United States continue to rise. They also rise throughout Asia. And as Jonathan and Howard saw in their visit to Asia, the incidence of prostate cancer and other cancers are rising as we begin this study. And so why have we had pressure on research? Because it costs the United States $1 trillion a year, the change in weight in the last 20 years. If we can solve this issue and get Americans to just weigh the same, it'll be one of the main growth areas for our country. The Prostate Cancer Foundation was the centerpiece of putting on the march in 1998. Its objectives were doubling of the NIH budget, doubling of the NCI budget, increase in the National Science Foundation budget. Many of you were with us at that event. Since 1998, the federal government has contributed $180 billion from just the NCI and the NIH incrementally, incremental investments, and with the National Science Foundation, over $200 billion. So the celebration of science in September was to show the American public and show the leaders uh, in our government what have we got for that incremental $200 billion and what has the world got? to demonstrate the returns on bioscience investment, to honor achievements in scientific research, to illustrate the potential for future advances that you've seen over the last day and a half and we'll see in the next day and a half. These advances that change what's gonna happen as you treat patients. 
and to recommit to funding medical research on a national and international basis. Sequencing the genome. First time, 13 years, more than $3 billion. Jonathan Rothberg from iTorrent Life Technologies was shipping the first chips the week after our celebration of science. And by the end of this year, we'll be able to sequence the genome in two hours for $1,000. What does that hold for all of us? It holds the potential that we, by sequencing each individual's genome, we will be able to deliver precision medicine. Here is a couple minute video that we showed at the Celebration of Science at Kennedy Center on Saturday night. My name is Stephanie Dosnick and I'm the mother of two children with cystic fibrosis. Keith is a freshman in high school. When he was diagnosed, they told us his life expectancy was about 18. So the current life expectancy is about 37, which is a pretty amazing advance in the, in the 14 years that Keith has been around. I am doing the best machine to break up the mucus inside of my lungs. I have to do it twice a day for 20 minutes a day. To have two siblings have cystic fibrosis is not very common. My little sister really looks up to me, and when she sees me do my treatment, she wants to do hers too because she wants to follow my footsteps. When I started Kaleidico, within four days, I stopped and took a deep breath in, and I wasn't coughing, and I could actually breathe to open my eyes to a future. I mean, I've never let anything stop me in the past. Now I'm thinking, oh man, I'm gonna be old and I'm gonna have gray hair. And that's what I talk about all the time. My dream is for patients to be adults and grandparents and great-grandparents and have gray hair. And I know that's, that is a fact now, it's gonna happen. And I know other patients with CF are gonna have uh, more endless opportunities because of this drug. If I could have one wish, my wish would be to have cure for cystic fibrosis. So I don't have to do my treatment machine anymore. Not have to carry around a bunch of pills. I think everyone should be excited about Kaleidico. I mean, we know that it works and we know what it does. It treats the underlying cause of cystic fibrosis. It's opening the doors for other, other drugs that will treat the other mutations for everyone else with cystic fibrosis. So we're there and we're on target. We know how to do this. So just uh, remain hopeful and excited because we, uh, we're close. So on the stage that light was Jim Watson, which eventually led to Francis Collins decoding the genome which eventually led to a disease-specific organization, almost all of which follow the prostate cancer model today, which led to a biotech company, which led to a treatment for 4 to 5 percent of the patients that you knew was going to work before you gave it to them. Obviously, this has not affected 100 percent of the patients, but the concept of precision medicine that all of you understand full well is once we understand who every patient is, hopefully we'll discover whether it's 10 or 20 different treatments that deal with each patient. At the formation of the Milk and Family Foundation in 1981-1982, we started with a focus not on prostate cancer, but and epilepsy and a number of other diseases, but one was pediatric AIDS. Elizabeth Glazer uh, got AIDS from a transfusion during childbirth, and she and her daughter Ariel, and later her son, all re received AIDS. And the Pediatric AIDS Foundation, Elizabeth Glazer, her husband was one of the stars uh, of a television show, 
and most of the entertainment community and my family and others rallied around supporting pediatric AIDS. Could we help the children and the families? At that time, as the case of Elizabeth Glazer, she passed AIDS on to both of her children. In 1987 on national television, Oprah Winfrey stated these words, research studies now project that one in five, listen to me, one in five, hard to believe, could be dead from AIDS by the end of the next three years. Wonder why America was concerned about interacting with AIDS patients. That's by 1990, Oprah said, one in five. In 1991, Magic Johnson, three-time NBA uh, MVP, had a press conference November 7th, 1991, telling the world that he had AIDS. Most viewers assume that he would eventually lose his life. But as Congressman Bill Bright pointed out, there was great mobilization on this activity. And at the NIH on Saturday during the celebration of science, we heard a young woman who contracted AIDS and HIV speak about medical progress, something all of us work towards. My name is Dawn Averett Bridge. In June 1988, I was 19 years old. I was a sophomore at NYU taking time off to live and work as a model in Europe. I came back to the States with some very swollen lymph nodes, and went through a battery of tests, got a presumptive diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You see, I couldn't tell anyone about the rape, so no one even thought about offering me an HIV test. After asking a doctor, if I could get an HIV test so I could get my HIV negative card, and he refused, there was no reason to test me. I decided to poke and prod and make it happen, and after a series of refusals, he gave me the HIV test. And on June 28, 1988, I walked into an exam room with my mother and my father, and my life changed forever. They said, you have HIV. This was a life-threatening, not even a life-threatening disease. Those days, it was a fatal disease. And all of a sudden, I was facing not never graduating from college, never having a career, never getting married, never having children, maybe never even being 21. And because of the stigma of HIV, I was told to not tell anyone either. So after being diagnosed with HIV in 1988, I progressed to AIDS by 1994. And like Moises and many others, I responded well to the new therapies and began to get my life back. But the thing that I wanted more than anything else in the entire world was to be a mom. So after turning 30 and hiking the, successfully hiking the entire Appalachian Trail and getting my health stabilized so that I was healthy and strong, I realized that the science was finally at a place where my risk of transmitting HIV to an infant was less than 2%. That was a greater than 98% chance that I would have a child who was uninfected. And it was time for me. So 14 years and one day after the door to motherhood had been seemingly shut, I gave birth to a beauty, beautiful, healthy, HIV-free baby girl, Madeline Grace, and 20 months later, to her sister, Sophia Alston. This was something that was never possible in 1988. This, the dream of being a mother was something that was so concrete for me at 19 years old. 
Death, maybe not so much, but motherhood, yes. And these are my miracle babies. The promise of science, the promise of what we do, and the enormous access to technology that's available to us today. Also with us at the celebration of science was Timothy Brown, the Berliner patient, the first person in the history of the world who had AIDS eliminated from his body. And 22 years after his press conference in 1991, Magic Johnson joined us with Tony Fauci to discuss his, his health and to discuss the tremendous future of eliminating AIDS as cause of death for everyone on the planet. The promise of science is with us. That $3.8 billion invested in the Human Genome Project over those 14 years has resulted, we calculate, an economic output of almost $800 billion and 310,000 jobs. In fact, NIH funding, as we pointed out, has resulted in hundreds of thousands of new jobs, new patents, supporting hundreds of thousands of scientists, and if we step back directly and indirectly, almost 5.3 million jobs just in the U.S. We all know the 21st century will see this competition for human capital. The fourth generation of young investigators to change the world has been completed, many of which are in the audience and sat that Saturday night in the first three rows at the Kennedy Center because we're so dependent on what they do to change the world for us. Earlier this year in 2012, we launched the Young Investigator Program in China. It's an honor to be there. And as I think about this event for the 20th year, it makes me think about the enormous investment that's occurred and the talent that is with us. In 1966, when it was announced that London would host the Olympics, in the 1996 Olympics, UK won one gold medal 15 medals and ranked 20th in the world. One gold medal. They decided that they were going to make an investment, a national lottery funding in the UK to develop elite athletes, no different than our young investigators. In 2000, the British team won 11 gold medals, an increase of 11-fold. By 2012, Head in the UK, they won 29 gold medals, 65 total medals, and ranked third. And ranked third and brought honor to their country and showed what an investment in talent can do. That same investment that we have made over 20 years. So in closing, I thought the words of Sebastian Coe were fitting for today. In every Olympic sport, and this is the Olympics you're at of prostate cancer, there's all that matters in life. Humans stretched to the limit of their abilities, inspired by what they can achieve, driven by their talent to work harder than they can believe possible, living for that moment, but making an indelible mark on history. You are making an indelible mark in history. Our investment over 20 years has enabled you to help change the world as it will in the future. And I'm honored to be at the 20th Olympiad of the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Thank you very much.